The part of the chapter I'm going to be focusing on here is at the very, very end there, actually the last verse. The Bible says, wisdom is better than weapons of war because he was just going on about how a, there's a little city, you know, and there's a wise man in that city that was able to basically save the city from destruction and that the wisdom that he had was better than any, we you know, you could bring these great massive weapons of war and stuff against it, but, but you can avoid the destruction from those if you have wisdom, if you're smart, if you have a lot of knowledge and you can figure out ways to, to you know, disable their, you know, whatever the, the, the weapons of war coming against you. And, and he was able to do that. And basically, um, he's saying wisdom in verse 16, and it said, I, wisdom is better than strength, right? It's a lot better to have, to be really wise and smart and have knowledge than it is to just have muscles and, and you know, armaments, guns, whatever, you know. Um, it's, it's better to be wise. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. But unfortunately, people are respecters of persons more than anything, so that if you have some poor guy, maybe some homeless guy, right, but it's got a lot of wisdom, someone who knows God's word really well and is really smart, no one wants to listen to him because they're a respecter of persons, right? And this is what he's talking about. But at the very end here, I'm going to be focusing in on this last verse. says, wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. So you have a lot of wisdom. You could do a lot of good. You could do a lot of, you know, in this case, there's a man saved a city. But all it takes is one sinner to destroy much good. And that's the, 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 the title of my sermon this evening is One Sinner Destroyeth Much Good. And this is a truth. This is a fact. This is something that we need to remember, recognize, be aware of, and pay attention to. Because, you know, anytime you're doing, you're trying to build something, you're trying to build a great work, you're, you keep moving forward. It's very similar to what I was talking about in my backsliding sermon just like a week or two ago when I preach on backsliding, how hard it can be to make the progress and how quick it could be to slide back down. Well, the same way when you're trying to build up something, you're trying to build a movement, you're trying to, to build up a church, you're trying to build up people to serve the Lord, and you're trying to make this great thing, one sinner can, can cause a lot of destruction and just tear that thing down. The power of one person to destroy. And I mean, destruction is easier than building anyways. I mean, Ask my kids that. I have, my older daughters love now building their, they use their mag formers and they build these great castles and whatever else with it. And then here comes Godzilla Johnny, right? And just with one swoop of the hand, <laughs> what they spent so much time building up is just in pieces and just all over the place. But that's the way that things work. It's easy to destroy and for one sinner can destroy much good. And we need to be aware of that. Uh, turn, if you would, to, well, the next, probably on the same page in, your, in the Bible there, in, in the first verse of chapter 10 in Ecclesiastes, the Bible says, Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. So, you have these ointments, and you know that the 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 apothecaries are the apothecary. People create these ointments, and they're typically you know good smelling, uh, you know lavender or whatever. You know you, you make these things, but then you get the the flies right, and they die in it, and they start to cause a stench that's not what you want in the you know in the ointment. And it, this is the illustration being used to demonstrate that when someone who is in, has a reputation. They are known to be wise. They are known to be honorable. They're known maybe some great man of God. All it takes is a little folly, a little foolishness, a slip up, you know, you know getting into some sin, you know, some stupid, foolish folly, just, just, just not being diligent, not paying attention, you know, Here's someone known for wisdom, known for honor, well-respected, gets caught doing whatever. And it ruins it. It sends forth that stinking savor, and that's what everyone's, you know, and all the work that you did, and you, you might have lived this life and been have a lot of integrity and done so many good things, and we need to be aware, one, you know, one screw-up sometimes can cause a lot of damage. 
Just like one sinner can destroy much good, you mess up one time, and look, this is important. You, know, th you can be having the best marriage, the best you know, family, the best everything, and I know this is a real serious thing. It's not something you slip and do, but I mean, one time you commit adultery and everything just be thrown away. I mean, literally, you can use all those years of, of everything good you were doing and everything you were building and all the respect you had and honor from your family, from your spouse, gone. Out the window in one evening. Destruction can happen really quickly. And we need to be paying attention. So you can have a lifetime of integrity and righteousness and have all of that hard work flushed down the toilet by committing one grievous sin. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. See, we need to be aware of this. One, because it can happen to something we're all collectively working on, like in this church, we're all working towards this greater good of, of serving the Lord, and we're putting in hours, we're going out soul winning, we're doing, you know, we, we, you're investing your own personal time for whatever, you know, to help out the church, and, and we've got this great work that we're trying to establish, and all it takes sometimes is one sinner to really make a, a you know, a stinking saver come from this church. And this is something I've, I've seen happen just recently with people that, you know, and I'll put it this way, you know, Everyone who comes to this church, you represent this church. You do. Whether, whether you like it or not, if you're a part of this church, you're a member of this church, the way that you behave yourself outside of this church is a reflection on this church. Not only is it a reflection on this church, it's a reflection on Jesus Christ. You're born again. People know that you're a saved person. You're a Christian. Oh, is this how a Christian acts? You know, we need to always remember that because the world's always going to be looking at that. Other people are always going to be looking at, at what you do because of the stand that you take on God's word. And collectively, you're taking a stand on God's word in this church. And the things that you do are going to be looked upon by everyone else, and, and it doesn't take much. We could be working really hard. We could have this great reputation. Oh, man, you know, Word of Truth Baptist Church, the people are really friendly. I went and visited that church. It's a great church. They really love the Lord. They're doing all this work. And then all it takes is one, one person to go out and just start railing, start, you know, spreading all kinds of heresies, try, you know, just getting into whatever kind of, of trouble they can, mischief, to really bring a, a bad mark on our church and destroy a lot of work that we're doing and have to rebuild all that back up again. But not only that, you, I want you to be paying attention to this also because it's not just the collective work, it's also individually. You, know, we need to catch, you need to catch yourself so you don't destroy your own life and destroy the work that you're working on because of this, the pleasures of sin for a season. Because of one thing that you just want to do and you're not, you're not um, paying attention and um, you know, being, being diligent in your own life. And you just kind of let things go and wind up backsliding, getting into sin, getting into a little folly and ruining your whole reputation. Your reputation is very important. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to say, well, I don't care what other people think about me. And, to, and to, in a sense, that's, that's fine. That's right. There's nothing wrong with, with that when you're doing right. It's a good attitude to have. I don't care what other people think about me or say about me when I'm serving God. I don't care if people ridicule me when I'm going out soul winning. I don't care what people say about me when I'm doing right. But you know what? I do care what people say about me in general. If, if, if I were to just get into sin, hey, that's a big deal. You know, I'm trying to maintain a reputation of someone who is righteous, someone who has wisdom, someone who's kept in honor. And I don't want to, you know, um, ruin that and destroy that testimony and destroy the character that's built up because of my own sin, because, because I've gotten myself involved in something that's going to destroy much good. Reputation is important. It's actually one of the qualifications for a person to become a pastor. You're in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse number 2. The Bible says that a bishop then must be blameless. Blameless means without blame, that people can't be blaming you for things that you've done wrong. Why? Because you've been behaving yourself properly. You've been acting and doing things in a way that's upright, that's above board. 
that no one's going to have any reason to accuse you of anything, and if they do, it's going to be falsely. A bishop that must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober of good behavior, given to hospitality, you have to teach. Look at verse number seven. Moreover, he must, all, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So there's your good reputation. That's what a good report is. That's people are reporting on you and on your actions, on who you are. You need to have a good reputation. You need to be, uh, have good favor among men, among people, and have a good report of them which are without. Not just people in the church that really like you because you're your friend, but outside of the church. People need to be able to say, hey, there's a guy of, of character. There's a guy of integrity. There's a man that's a man of his word. There's a man that's faithful. There's a man that's a faithful. That is a good report that you need to have in order to become a pastor. Your, your reputation is important. Reputation is important just for the sake of having a reputation. Your rep reputation is important because it's based on what, the work that you're doing. It's based on your character. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 2. I mean, look at what happened to Solomon. Solomon, and we just went through this. We went through the, the book of 1 Kings, right? Solomon did a lot of work for the Lord. You could say he did great works. I mean, he built a temple, right? He was, he, was, he, he was establishing the Lord and the service of the Lord and doing all kinds of great things in his life, had a great testimony, had a great work. Hey, there's someone who is esteemed to have a lot of wisdom, Right? More wisdom than any king that's ever been before him or any king afterwards because God gave him that wisdom. And what did he do with it? He married a bunch of strange wives that turned his heart away from God. And how was Solomon then ultimately remembered? He destroyed so much good. Destroyed the good that he did. Just through his sin, through, through desiring many wives, multiplying to himself wives, the Bible says he's not supposed to do, explicitly in the law, that a king is not supposed to multiply wives to themselves. He did that. And uh, that's what he loved. He loved many strange women. And as a result, he ended up sinning against God and his, his good reputation, his wisdom and everything got brought way down and it also gave people an opportunity to blaspheme God because of him, because of his failures. And we need to make sure that we all take heed lest we fall. That's the main point of why I'm even preaching this sermon tonight. There's a lot of things going on, bringing bad marks and bad names on, on the other churches. I don't want that to happen to our church. I don't want it to happen to those churches either. But this is what happens. One sinner can destroy much good. Now, I'm not saying it's the church's fault. I'm just saying there's people out there, there's sinners out there that are just causing all kinds of damage and corruption and just trying to destroy the work that God is getting done through these churches. And look at the aftermath then of, of what happened with Solomon. Not just his own reputation, but as a result of his sin, then the, the kingdom's divided into two. And then you have the greater part being involved in extreme wickedness for many, many years, decades, centuries even. That, that greater nation of Israel just kind of went off the deep end. And you know what? You could bring all that back to Solomon. If Solomon hadn't done what he'd done, history would be different. I mean, that, he's the reason why God decided to, break, to divide up the kingdom. Could have been united and, and, and done way more work. For, I mean, they ju he just built the temple. This is supposed to be the, you know, the lighthouse of Israel, like in their, in their, in their peak, you know, from God promising Abraham and, and building this great nation and them going into Egypt and coming into the promised land and all, like, I mean, everything culminating into having Finally, we're here. We're established. We have our land. We're setting up, you know, we have this kingdom set up. We're building this great temple to the Lord. All thrown away. All trashed. And then requiring 
that much more work even just to get back to where they were. Sin is destructive. And one sinner destroyeth much good. You're in Romans chapter 2. Look at verse number um, 21. The Bible says, Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? What is he talking about here? Hypocrites, right? People who want to get up and they sound real righteous. And look, beware of this. Because all these things that he's saying, I know you agree with. As far, when it comes to preaching a man that shouldn't steal, amen. Let's preach that a man shouldn't steal. Preach that a man should not commit adultery, amen. Let's preach that a man should not commit adultery. Pre, you know, pre, uh, uh, hating idols, amen. That's the word of God. The problem comes in is when you got a man who's preaching these things and saying not to do them, and then they go around and turn, and then they do the same thing. Destroys it. Who wants to listen to a person like that? Do as I say, not as I do. Verse 23, Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? Look at verse 24. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. The hypocrites, the people that get involved in the sins that they, they, they rail against, they preach against, are the ones then that are going to end up blaspheming the name of God through their own actions and not keeping themselves pure and keeping themselves righteous. Look, it's not always easy to do, but it's, it's really necessary. And you have to understand the implications of your sin and that sometimes just one major sin can just destroy a life's work. Destroy and at the same time, blaspheme God. Remember that the next time you're being tempted by something that you know, I mean, is, I mean, and, you know, these are things, look at what he brings up here. Stealing, committing adultery, idols, idol worship, idolatry. These are big sins. This isn't just... I listened to a worldly song for too long or something. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it, this, is, this is like, I mean, I cheated on my wife. I offered up a sacrifice unto an idol. This is a big deal. I mean, even stealing. But think about that. You're going to tell other people to be, you know, oh, you need to have respect and, and honor and be upright and be, have integrity and then you steal? That blasphemes the name of God. So hopefully you're not even close to committing any of these sins, but if, that, if these thoughts ever, because it all starts in your mind anyways, all of this stuff, it's gonna st you, you start going down that path. You better catch yourself quick and get right back and realize that I don't, wanna, I don't want God's name to be blasphemed because I'm weak or because I had a weak moment because I did something I shouldn't have done because I was too wrapped up in, in my sinful flesh. Your hypocrisy is going to cause Christ's name to be blasphemed. Turn, if you would, to Joshua chapter number 7. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, 1, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Many people don't think that their pet sin really has anything to do with anyone else. You know what I'm talking about. Whatever sin that you have in your life that you don't want to get rid of, whatever it is that you like that you know is wrong, that one thing, that one pet sin that you, could you try to justify it to yourself and you say, this is only affecting me. I'm not dragging anyone else into this. I'm not sinning against someone else. You're sinning against God. But it's something that you just want to keep doing because you're in your flesh. And may, you don't want to think that that has, nothing, has anything to do with anyone else. 
because you're still trying to justify it to yourself. And some people are willing to accept the chasing and it comes their way from God because they like that sin so much. You just, you just say like, you know what? I know I'm going to be punished for this, but I want to keep doing it anyways. It's a bad attitude to have. Don't deceive yourself into thinking that it's only going to come down on you and that you'll be prepared for it. And whatever I get disciplined, uh, it's fine. Because it's not always just you. You're always going to be impacting other people. We have the perfect example of this in the Bible with Achan in Joshua chapter 7. The sin of one person can have huge consequences not only on you, but on the collective, on the group, on this church. One man's sin had a huge impact on the entire congregation of the children of Israel. Look at verse number 1 of Joshua 7. The Bible says, but the children of Israel, look at, and look at what it says, the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. How did the children of Israel commit a trespass? For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. So if you're not familiar with this story, the children of Israel go into this battle, and they're told to wipe everything out. This is the first battle. God gives them victory. They say, you know what? You don't get anything from this. They get the spoil from the next battle. But he says, this one, you go in there, you destroy them, you kill the livestock, you just wipe it out, and you're done with it. Don't take anything. Well, during the midst of this, of this battle, they win this victory. Achan's in one of those tents. He sees some silver and changes a garment. Huh. Yeah, I know we were told not to do this. I know we were told just to leave it all and that we're going to burn it all or whatever. We're going to destroy it all. But, you know, how does this impact anybody else? I'll just take this stuff. No, no one's going to know about it. I'm not hurting. I mean, these people are already dead that own it. I'm not hurting anybody, right? No one has to know. I'll just go and take it home. That's what he did. He buried it under his tent. Well, look what happened. Look at verse number 10. Because that's what he did. And you might think, how would this possibly hurt anybody else? This is only me. And maybe God will punish me because I did something that he told me not to do, but it's only going to affect me. Wrong. Verse number 10, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore, because Joshua was upset that they lost their battle, and he's just like, he has no clue what's going on. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned. And look at God said, Israel hath sinned. Did he say Achan hath sinned? He says, Israel hath sinned. And earlier in verse 1, he said, The children of Israel are in transgression. Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. One man's sin, Achan. He sinned in a way that probably never would have thought anyone else could be affected. You know what happened? People died in battle because God wasn't with them anymore. Because God looked at it and said, if you're not all on board, if you're not all going to listen to my commandments, then you're all going to suffer for it. Achan was the weak link. Achan was the one that caused problems on all the children of Israel. And Achan also ended up paying for this with his life. You think that was worth it? Your one sin can have huge consequences. God can chasten the entire church over the actions of one person. And think about it. I mean, think about um, where's your heart? Do you love this church? Now, I'm not saying this is the case, but I mean, you know, we've got a small church right now. Are you harboring some pet sin that you don't want to get rid of? Maybe, maybe that's why the church hasn't grown. And look, I'm, I'm not making any accusations on that. I, you know, there's a lot of reasons that, that things happen in, in life. 
But you need to just think about that for yourself. If you've got your own sins on, hey, this isn't just going to affect me. This could affect my spouse. This could affect my family. This could affect everybody else. Just people who are completely innocent, don't even know, causing problems. I mean, what, it happened with Achan. David, happened with David too. Turn if you would to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. This isn't just a standalone case with Achan. This is something that we see in the Bible in multiple places. You remember when David numbered Israel? David took the number of Israel. He said, well, well, what's the big deal? He's just counting how many people there to be able to fight in a battle. Well, the big deal is that God told him not to. Just like the big deal with Achan was that God said not to take it. So when God says no, you don't say yes. It doesn't matter if you understand why or why not. You can't do something. You just believe God. God said not to do it. David did it anyways. David was even, you know, um, Joab was trying to tell him, like, look, man, you know, like, God's going to bless us. Don't number the people. Even Joab, you know, wicked Joab, who did so many other things wrong. Even he's saying, like, we don't need to number the people. But he did it anyways. Look at, you're in 1 Chronicles 21, look at verse number 7. The Bible says, and God was displeased with this thing. Therefore, he smote Israel. Wait, who sinned? David. Who ordered the counting? David did. Who's the one responsible? David. God was displeased. Who'd he smite? Israel. Verse 8. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. He's owning up to it, but he's saying, hey, look, God, I did this. But now I beseech thee, do away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And the Lord spake unto Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things, choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Choose thee, either three years famine, or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while that the sword of thine enemies overtaketh thee, or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coasts of Israel. Now therefore advise thyself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for very great are his mercies, but let me not fall into the hand of man. Verse 14, so the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel and their fellow of Israel, 70 thousand men let your mind get wrapped around that number for a minute 70,000 men died by disease pestilence completely and directly as a result of David's sin your sin does not just affect you keep that in mind don't let that be some justification for yourself to continue in your sin. Because it's not just you that's going to be affected by it. It's other people. Innocent people. I mean, this, it doesn't even tell us who the people are. It's just, just random people, innocent people, destroyed because of David. Because of what he decided to do. Because of Achan and what he decided to do. Look at verse 17. It says, And David said unto God, is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? So David's pleading with God. But it's too late at this point. He already did the sin. Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Lord, my God, be on me and on my father's house, but not on thy people that they should be plagued. He's pleading with God. Why? It's got to weigh, it's got, it must have weighed really heavy on David's heart. I, I, I mean, I don't see how it couldn't have to be knowing that you're the one responsible for these people dying when it was your sin. Don't forget that. When you've got your sin that you, you don't want to be corrected on and you just want to do anyways, you know, think about these stories and think about if you want that weighing on yourself, some, some actions that you do weighing on other people, other people that you love, other people that you care about. Now, most of what I'm applying these verses to is the church because this is our collective, you know, just like the children of Israel was, you know, was this group. Well, we've got a group here. 
but think about your own family. It's the same danger that your family faces when you decide to get into sin. Turn if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. What are we talking about tonight? One sinner destroyeth much good. And sometimes one sin, not just a sinner, one sin in your life can destroy what you've been working for and can destroy not only yourself but people around you. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 1. Why do we have to treat this so seriously? Verse number 1, the Bible says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirits, have, al have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven... Leaven it the whole lump. He's talking about this sin. He says this is reported commonly. I mean, this is just out in the open. People just know this. It's a common fact that at the church of Corinth, there's, there's someone in the church that's just in open fornication and not just your average fornication, but something that the unsaved heathen don't even do that the world's not even participating in, that they would say is wicked, is going on in your church and you're not even mourning about it, but you're just proud and lifted up and just not a big deal. And he says the way that, you know, don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? This is why we have to take a hard stance on sin because first of all, one sinner destroyeth much good, but then when you tolerate that, you're opening up everything to just, to just completely be destroyed. Just the, the whole lump can go and be worthless when, when the sin is just tolerated. When it's just accepted. When people could just keep doing these things and nothing happens about it. And then the Bible gives us a very specific list. And, and I'm not going to re-preach this, but I preached this last week on you know, things that God considers to be Grievous sins, a big deal, bad enough for you to say, hey, this is leaven in our congregation and this is going to be gone and we're not going to put up with this. And if, you're, if you are in this camp, if you are guilty of these things, we're breaking fellowship with you and you're not coming back in here until you repent. Look at verse number seven. The Bible says, purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle, not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must you need to go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. And I'm not going to preach through all that again. I've preached sermons multiple times going through every sin in that list. We need to realize, one, if you, don't, if you have this, this attitude that you don't think that one of these sins in this list is a big deal, you say, well, what's the big deal about that? Then you don't understand God, and you don't understand how serious this sin is. And that's all the more reason to be aware Say, oh, well, I didn't know it was really that big of a deal to be a railer. I didn't know it was that big of a deal to be a drunkard. No, if someone's a drunkard or a railer or idolater or extortioner, we're not even supposed to have food with you. We're not even supposed to go to lunch with you. Let alone you joining up and fellowshipping and congregating with us here. If you're guilty of these sins, you're called a brother. The Bible says, sorry, go and get yourself right with God because that's wicked. And a spirit of rebellion starts with one person. It's all it takes. One person to have that rebellious attitude before it spreads. 
A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 20. One sinner destroyeth much good. The devil knows this, and this is why you have wolves in sheep's clothing. This is why, you know, I know I'm shifting gears here a little bit. 1 Corinthians 5, this is talking about people among the church. Not necessarily a wolf, just, I mean, anybody. I don't care who you are. This doesn't mean you're a false prophet. You're guilty of these sins. That's a big deal. And you're going to destroy much good by being a part of this church where we're preaching against adultery. We're preaching against drunkardness. We're preaching against, um, you know, extortion and, and covetousness and railing. We're preaching against this stuff. So we don't need you coming in and destroying much good by participating in that. But another way that, that one sinner can destroy much good is in, the, is in the, the wolf that comes in in sheep's clothing. The one that comes in whose purpose is to destroy, whose purpose is specifically to come in to a place where God is getting a lot of things done and people are dedicated and people are working and serving the Lord and doing all kinds of things and, have, and, and send in that infiltrator to go in and cause division and cause churches to split and cause people to, to be infighting instead of fighting against the, the devil and turn people around and twist them around. The wolves in sheep's clothing are out to destroy and draw many people away and do much damage. That's their goal. Look at verse number 28 of Acts chapter 20. The Bible says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. This is how important this message is that the Apostle Paul says, look, the time of my departing is at hand. I know that there is going to be grievous wolves. They're going to come in. They're going to come in from among you and you don't even realize they're there. And as soon as I'm gone, they're going to make it known. They're going to be teaching perverted things and trying to draw people away. And I've been warning you and warning you and warning you for three years. With tears. That's how much he cares about these people. They look, these wolves are going to come in and they're going to destroy. And they're going to just tear down the work that we've been doing here. We need to be aware of this. We see this happening around us and it hasn't happened here yet, but watch out because it's coming. The Apostle Paul wouldn't be spending so much time talking about this and preaching about this if it wasn't true, if it wasn't going to happen. The false prophets, the wolves in sheep's clothing, their job is to come in and destroy. And we need to be aware of it. Now, does that mean we go on a witch hunt with every single thing that every person says? Absolutely. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yep, we do. We just take every single sentence that any person has ever said every time and say, are you the Judas? No, we don't do that. But we, do, we are aware of it. Okay, and, and, you know, I know I'm making light of it, but, but it really is a serious thing. It's because I'm going to do a lot of damage. And the reason why, we, you know, we, we have to keep this in mind because the, your, your initial response, especially with people that creep in, is going to think, oh, you know, this person would never do that. This person, you know, I'm misunderstanding something. That's how it starts off. But when someone starts per, you know, preaching perverted doctrines and just taking you aside and talking to you about things that's not being taught from the pulpit, that's not, you know, hey, have you talked to pastor about this? Hey, do you, you know, watch out for this stuff because that's how it creeps in. And it could be a close friend of yours. You know what? I hope not, but, one, but I, I, it probably will happen one day. I don't see why it wouldn't unless we're just not doing anything for God because then there'd be no reason to have the attacks. But as long as we're doing right and doing good and getting people saved and, and doing a great work, 
There is going to be a reason to have an infiltrator here. There is going to be the, the reason for the devil to try to split up and destroy this church. And look, I believe that even uh, very firmly, especially in this area, because the more that I've learned about the, the history of independent fundamental Baptist churches that have been around in this area, I, I've heard about split after split after split and these churches dying and going away. I mean, even since we opened up our doors three and a half years ago, two churches that I know of have closed their doors and are gone. That supposedly had the right, I mean, I don't know them personally, but had the right gospel, King James only, independent Baptist churches. Gone. They're split, been attacked. So you better believe it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen here. But you need to be vigilant and aware of these things. I need to be vigilant and aware of these things. Let's not let one sinner, you know, tear down the work that we're all working together for. Do our best to be on guard. Turn, if you would, to James 3. The damage of sin can be profound. The damage of one sinner, the damage of one false prophet, the damage of these people can do a lot. And we do, you know, are we going to be able to stop it all the time? No, but we need to be aware of it. And you need to be wise and you need to be just, just ready and, and um, aware so that you can, you can, we can try to stop this stuff before it becomes a big problem at our church. Even the things that we say, the words that come out of our mouth can do a lot of damage. So far, everything we looked at has been our actions, right? People, things, things that Achan did, he stole. You know, what David did, he numbered the, the people, children of Israel. What people do, you know, when you commit a sin, when you, when you commit fornication or adultery or, or you do these things that are wicked, you get involved in these sins. But even just the things that we say can cause a lot of destruction. And we need to be very conscious of that, of, of the language that we use, the appropriateness, and especially with getting involved in matters that don't belong to you. The Bible says, even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is esteemed, is esteemed wise. James 3, verse number 5, the Bible says, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. We know this more than, than anyone else at this point with the fires we've been having here in town. I don't know if they ever figured out what the actual cause was of it, but, they, but whatever it was, they're saying it started small. It could start with, with a spark. It could start with a cigarette butt. And look at what we're left with, like 25,000 plus some acres all burned up and destroyed, all started really small. And the Bible's using that illustration. And let that sink in your head when you leave tonight and you look at the smoke still coming out over the mountain over there because it's still burning. And, and the, dis, the massive destruction, when this is all done, take a trip out there and think about this verse in James chapter 3. Go out there, take a look at all of the destruction, and behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And then remember that that amount of destruction is what the Bible's referring to that your tongue can do. Just saying the wrong things, getting involved in in. in garbage on, on the internet or even at home or wherever where you're just saying things that, that you shouldn't be saying. You do a lot of damage. One sinner destroyeth much good. Proverbs 17, 9 reads, He that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. We're talking about someone who's a tale bearer, someone who goes around telling stories. And talking about people behind their back and, and, you know, repeating a matter. Oh, I heard so-and-so said this and just break destruction, right? Causing divisions, causing people to, to lose friendships as opposed to just covering the transgression. Okay, this one said something wrong, but I'm not going to just bring it up and just make a bigger deal out of it than it needs to be. And let me add, by the way, I wasn't even going to bring this up, but there is some wisdom in covering a transgression. You know, I hear, I hear so many people, oh, you know, we shouldn't be sweeping things under the rug. Look, when there's a big deal, I mean, if someone's a child molester, we're not going to sweep that under the rug. 
When there's some big thing, especially here at church, if someone's guilty of fornication, adultery within our church, you know, we're not going to sweep that under the rug. We're going to break fellowship with that person, person. But there are many instances where you ought to just, let's cover that transgression because we don't want to make that, make, make some big deal out of something that really, yes, this person screwed up, but we're going to look past that and forgive that person and not just allow it to cause more damage because they said something stupid. There is wisdom to that. So Proverbs says so. Proverbs 18.8 says, The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Be aware of our words. Be aware of your actions. Be aware of the sin that, that you get involved in and how much damage it really can do. We're working really hard here to do a great work. I know I am, and I know you are too. I'm not the only one working here. We're all in this together. The things that you say and do not only reflect on yourself, but also on your family and also on this church. Much destruction can come from one sinner. It takes quite a bit of time and resources to build something great, to just keep working and building it, but it takes a very small amount of time and only one person to bring everything down. Beware of that. Be conscious of that. First and foremost, just for your own life, when it comes to your own struggles and your own temptations and your own flesh, remember that. And, and think of all of the consequences that go along with sin. And hopefully that'll help you to not continue to, to commit sins and do things that you know are wrong. Let this be one more reason not to do something when, when you get that moment. Because oftentimes you're faced with this moment and you're feeling tempted in your flesh to do something you know is wrong, let this come to mind. Also be aware of the false prophets. Be aware of the people who are bent on destruction. Be aware that that easily can creep into churches and, and into this church and can even come from someone that you might have known for a while and never would have expected it to come from. We're not going on a witch hunt here, but just be aware of it. And let the pastor know, let me know about these things because way too many times no one ever says anything to anyone. Obviously, there's some times you want to be able to, to overlook some things and cover transgression, but when, if it comes to something like heresy and things that is very indicative of a false prophet to do, that's what you really need to be aware of. I'm not talking about someone just sinning against one person in church. I'm talking about, you know, just severe false doctrine coming in or people being real sneaky about things and, and whatever in this church and, and the things that are kind of the MO of a, of a false prophet. So be aware of that. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, for our, uh, our great church here. Even though it's small, dear Lord, I know that the people here love you and, we're, and we are trying to do a, a great work for you. God bless our work. Help us to, uh, to keep ourselves from these grievous sins, dear Lord. Help us to, to really um, have a good understanding of all the consequences of our sin. That we, we, It's not just going to be affecting us, dear Lord, when we, um, when we choose to willfully just go against the things that you've told us not to do. But that other people be involved. And um, Lord, help us to be vigilant. Help us to take heed to ourselves lest we fall and help us also be diligent and vigilant in our, in our um, you know, looking out for the wolves that, that are going to try to come in in sheep's clothing and um, destroy and split our church, dear Lord. And I pray that you please just give us the wisdom to, to see past them and to be able to, um, to, to out them and, and, and uh, continue just to, to be focused on serving you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.